بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we spoke about the, the emigration of the early Muslims to Abyssinia. The persecution in Mecca became so severe, a number of the companions of the Prophet were subject to unimaginable torture to, to an extent where the Prophet felt that they were no longer safe in Mecca. And he urged them to emigrate to Abyssinia. Now the Hijrah to Abyssinia uh, took place in two waves. There were two emigrations to Abyssinia. We mentioned that the first emigration to Abyssinia uh, was led by Uthman ibn Mad'un, the famous companion of the Prophet, and he was accompanied by about 15 people. And then there was a second emigration to Abyssinia, which was led by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Now, <clears throat> before we continue our discussion on what happened after the second emigration to Abyssinia, I think it's important for us to shed light on a, on a very important fictitious story that was concocted uh, during this period. If you recall, Shortly after the first emigration to Habasha, to Abyssinia, the Muslims returned to Mecca after a few months. And when you look at the historical reports, you find that the reason why the, the first wave of emigrants returned to Mecca is because they heard a rumor. There was a rumor that uh, there was a rumor that the chiefs, that the leaders of Mecca, had all accepted Islam. So Uthman ibn Mal'un and those who accompanied him, they decided to return to Mecca. You know, what's the point in living in exile, living in this foreign land, if the leaders of Mecca had embraced Islam, if they embraced Islam, surely it would be safe for us to return. Now, what was this rumor based on? This rumor that the leaders of Mecca, the Mushrikeen of Mecca, the likes of Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl and their ilk, the reason why this rumor existed is because of reports that are primarily found in Sunni sources. And of course, when we say Sunni sources, we have to mention that these are not considered primary Sunni sources. We can call them you know, secondary or even tertiary sources. And they highlight an incident which later becomes known, especially in Oriental circles, as the incident of the Satanic Verses. Now, according to this fictitious story, the Prophet ﷺ had been engaged in reciting Surat al najm to the Mushrikeen. He was reciting the 53rd Surah of the Qur'an. And when he reaches verses 19 and 20, where Allah says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةَ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى Have you then considered the Lat and the Uzza and Manat, the third, the last? And these are basically the three most prominent idols in the eyes of Quraysh. According to this story, after the Prophet recites verses 19 and 20 from Surah Al-Najm, Shaytan caused the Prophet, inserted two sentences that were not part of Surah Al-Najm. 
And, th- and that sentence or that expression is They, meaning Lat and Manat and Uzza, they are beautiful, high-ranking birds. It seems that these idols, they have some type of form uh, and their, their form in certain realms, in certain dimensions, are high-ranking birds. And their intercession is anticipated. Now, according to this story, shaitan interferes with the process of revelation and basically inserts this sentence into the Qur'an. And the Prophet recites this line, essentially praising the idols. And this is ultimately what the mushrikeen wanted from the Prophet. Because the mushrikeen themselves believed in Allah. They believed that He was the Creator. But they wanted the Prophet to acknowledge that their idols are intercessors. That they are lesser gods. They are subservient to Allah, but they function as intercessors between creation and the Creator. So the story goes that the mushrikeen were overwhelmed with joy and they became so jubilant and joyous that they prostrated with the Prophet when he concluded the recitation of Surah An-Najm because Surah An-Najm ends with a, uh, a verse of sajda. So this, is, this incident is known as the incident of the satanic verses. Now, as I mentioned, this story is not mentioned in the most authentic Sunni sources. I'll mention what is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is considered the most authentic, the most reliable source of hadith in the Sunni tradition. And then you'll see uh, what is what is considered authentic uh, according to mainstream Sunni Islam and then we'll look at some of the secondary and tertiary sources and, and try to gain an understanding of what is the Sunni position on this issue and then inshallah we'll, uh, we'll speak about what is the Shi'i understanding of, uh, of some of these narrations. So looking at the Sunni sources related to this incident if we go to Sahih al-Bukhari in the section titled Prostration During Recital of the Qur'an, it's an entire section in Bukhari, we find the following narration. And this tradition is transmitted by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And he says, And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi qara'a surat al-najm fasajada biha, the Prophet recited Surah An-Najm, the 53rd chapter of the Qur'an, and prostrated. فَمَا بَقِيَ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ إِلَّا سجد. So not only did the Prophet prostrate, Surah An-Najm had such a powerful impact on all of those who were present that all of the people prostrated, including the mushrikeen, فَأَخَذَ رَجُلٌ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ كَفًّا مِنْ حَصَى أَوْ تُرَابٍ فَرَفَعَهُ إِلَى وَجْهِهِ وَقَالَ يَكْفِينِ هَذَا فَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ بَعْدُ قُتِلَ كَافِرًا So Abdullah ibn, ibn Mas'ud, he says, the Prophet recited Surah Al-Najm and prostrated while reciting it and all the people prostrated and a man amongst the people took a handful of stones or earth and raised it to his face and said, this is sufficient for me. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud comments that later on, I saw him killed as a non-believer. So even this man, who was too arrogant to go down and perform a sajda, he at the very least humbled himself before the recitation of Surat and najm and placed some earth or some stone on his forehead to indicate 
his some degree of humility before the exquisite recital of Surah An-Najm. And, and some say that this is uh, Al-Walid ibn, ibn al-Mughira, others say that this is uh, you know, Abu Jahal. The point is that when the Prophet recited Surah An-Najm, it bedazzled all of the people who were there, including the Mushrikeen, and they themselves uh, prostrated. In another narration found in Bukhari, we read that Ibn uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, about the Prophet, قَالَ سَجَدَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ And of course, it says, صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ The, the wa'alihi is, is from me. قَالَ سَجَدَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ بِالنَّجْمِ وَسَجَدَ مَعَهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَالْمُشْرِكُونَ وَالْجُنُّ وَالْإِنسِ Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, the Prophet performed a prostration when he finished reciting Surah Al-Najm. And all of the Muslims and the pagans and jinns and human beings prostrated along with him. Now, this is all that we find in Sahih al-Bukhari. There is no mention, so we have to be objective, you know, we don't want to, you know, make any false accusations. So when you look at Sahih al-Bukhari, you find that there is no mention of Iblis tampering or inserting ayat and corrupting revelation. There is no mention of this. What we find is that the Prophet, he recites Surah Al-Najm, the Mushrikeen, are bewildered, they're overwhelmed, they're enchanted by the beauty of the Qur'an, and they fall into sujood. Now as a comment, you know, parenthetically, we can state that we as Shia Muslims, we don't have any problem with, with, with such narrations, with this specific narration. And this, ver- this might have very well happened, and it could be, brothers and sisters, that because the mushrikeen did sujood, because they were so enchanted by the beauty of the Qur'an, this is perhaps what caused that rumor to spread. That the leaders of Quraysh, that the leaders of the pagans, had embraced Islam. So this is probably where the rumor originated. Some Muslims, or some people, some of the residents of Mecca, perhaps witnessed this, and assumed that because the mushrikeen prostrated after the Prophet recited Surah Al-Najm, they understood that as a conversion to Islam. And then the news spreads like wildfire. The rumor reaches Abyssinia that the leaders of the pagans have embraced Islam, and this is perhaps what prompted many of them to return to Mecca. This is one possible theory. So, to be honest, we have to be honest and objective. In Sahih al-Bukhari, there is no mention of the satanic verses or the insertion of those satanic verses. However, when we come to Tafsir al-Tabari, and Tafsir al-Tabari is a Sunni Tafsir of the Qur'an, And even Sunni scholars of hadith will admit that, yes, when you look at these individual narrations, and we'll we'll go through this narration in Tabari, when you go through individual narrations on the topic of the satanic verses, you'll find that they're all weak. But because there are so many of them that have their own chains of transmission, even though there are some gaps, some scholars, and we'll come to speak about them, some scholars believe that the sheer quantity of these narrations indicates that something must have happened. So we look at the uh, look at the Tafsir al-Tabari. In Tafsir al-Tabari, we read the following, and 
the narration says, and this is, you'll find it in the section on the tafsir of Surah Al-Najm. So the narration says, جَلَسَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ فِي نَادٍ مِنْ أَنْدِيَةِ قُرَيْشِ The Prophet was sitting in a gathering with Quraysh, with the pagans. فَتَمَنَّى يَوْمَئِذٍ أَنْ لَا يَأْتِيهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ فَيَنْفَرُّ عَنْ the Prophet was sitting with Quraysh and because there was so much tension between the Muslims and the pagans, the Prophet in his heart, he was hoping that Allah would not reveal anything that would antagonize the pagans. He was hoping that there are no verses that are going to create more problems and more tension between the Muslims and the pagans. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ So Allah revealed وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى He reveals Surah Al-Najm. فَقَرَأَهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Prophet recited what was revealed to him. He recited Surah Al-Najm. Allah knew what was in the heart of the Prophet, that there was you know, some uneasiness about exacerbating and you know, adding more fuel to the fire between the pagans and the Muslims. So Allah reveals Surat Al-Najm. Hatta idha balagha. Until the Prophet reaches verses 19 and 20 of Surat Al-Najm. Until he reaches the verses 19 and 20 where Allah says, and do you not consider Laat uh, and Uzza and Manat? So as the Prophet is reciting what is being revealed to him, Tabari reports this narration, أَلْقَى عَلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانُ كَلِمَتَيْنِ Satan inserted two sentences. What were those two sentences? تِلْكَ الْغَرَانِقَةُ الْعُلْيَا وَإِنَّ شَفَاعَتُهُنَّ لَتُرْجَى those, meaning those three idols, those are the beautiful lofty birds whose intercession is anticipated. فَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَا So shaitan inserts this. So it seems that according to this narration, the Prophet could not distinguish between Jibra'il and Iblis. Can you imagine? What kind of prophet is this that he cannot distinguish between whether this is coming from Jibra'il or if this is coming from Iblis? Thumma mada, the prophet, he continued reciting. Thumma mada faqara as surata kullaha. So the prophet recited what was interjected by Iblis and he kept on reciting until he finished the surah. وَسَجَدَ الْقَوْمُ جَمِيعًا مَعَهُ And all of the people prostrated with the Prophet. So according to this narration, because the Prophet said something in praise of the idols, they felt that the Prophet had appeased them and they joined him in sujood. So the Prophet is doing sajda to Allah and they're doing sajda to their idols. They felt that we finally came to a compromise. Muhammad has finally praised our idols. This is what we wanted from him. This narration mentions that Walid ibn al-Mughira, he picks up some soil, some dirt, and he puts it on his forehead. And he basically made that his sajda. This narration mentions that he was an elderly man who could not do Sujood, he didn't have the power or the ability to prostrate. So he lifted some soil and placed it on his forehead as a way of prostrating. Now the narration doesn't end there. It gets even worse, brothers and sisters. فَلَمَّا أَمْسَى In the evening. So the Prophet recited the surah. He recited those, the, the satanic the verses that were inserted until evening. فَلَمَّا أَمْسَى أَتَاهُ جِبْرَائِيلِ In the evening, at that night, 
Jibra'il came to the Prophet. Jibra'il came to basically review the Quran with the Prophet, to review what, what was revealed. So Jibra'il asks the Prophet that recite what I have revealed to you today. When the Prophet recited Surah An Najm, he recited those satanic verses. So Jibra'il said to the Prophet, Ma ji'tuka bihatain. I didn't reveal these two sentences to you. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ افْتَرَيْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَقُلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يَقُلْ The Prophet said, Oh my, did I say, did I attribute a lie to God? Have I attributed to God something that he did not actually say? So the Prophet has a panic attack, saying that did I really attribute something to Allah that he did not say? فَمَا زَالَ مَغْمُومًا مَهْمُومًا The Prophet was so distraught, so grief-stricken, until Allah revealed Surah Al-Hajj, verse 52. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ إِلَّا إِذَا تَمَنَّا أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَّتِهِ فَيَنْسَخُ اللَّهُ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ ثُمَّ يُحْكِمُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ The Prophet was distressed, he was distraught until Allah revealed to the Prophet. It seems that Allah, based on this narration, He uses this verse to console him for being tricked by shaitan. So Allah reveals to the Prophet, and we did not send before you, and we did not send before you any messenger or prophet, but when he desired and the word إِذَا tamanna, some they translated as recite. But when you recite or you desire, Satan casts some falsehood in his recital or in his desire. But God annuls that which Satan casts. Then does God establish his communications and Allah is knowing and wise. Now, we'll get to the meaning of this verse shortly. But the incident of the satanic verses is not something that non-Muslim Orientalists invented. It is found in certain sources. It's found in secondary, if you want to call them, or tertiary uh, Sunni sources. Now, to be fair, there are many prominent, and one could even say perhaps the majority of Sunni scholars reject these narrations that claim that shaitan inserted two sentences and essentially corrupted and distorted the process of revelation. That seems to be the majority of the opinion among Sunni scholars. Some of the most prominent Sunni ulama who reject the second version. Now they all accept the first uh, version which is mentioned in Bukhari. And looking at that narration, it doesn't seem to be problematic. What they reject is narrations like the one that was mentioned by Tabari in his tafsir. So you have Fakhr razi categorically rejects uh, these such reports. Ibn Kathir rejects it. Al Qadil Al Iyad, he rejects it. Even Al Albani, who is one of the famous contemporary Sunni scholars of Hadith, he says that all of the, these narrations that, that suggest that Iblis, that Satan, inserted verses and fooled the Prophet are uh, false and should be rejected. Now with that said, there are some prominent Sunni scholars who accept the possibility of the incident. And these are not, you know, ordinary scholars. These are some of the most illustrious, the most well-respected scholars in Sunni Islam. We take the first. One prominent name 
one prominent Sunni scholar of hadith, who accepts a version or a certain interpretation of the incident of the satanic verses is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Hajar is a scholar of hadith. And his specialty, he's a specialist on Sahih al-Bukhari. In fact, he wrote a very lengthy and comprehensive sharh, a commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari. Now, he makes the point that, yes, he acknowledges that when you look at all of these individual reports about shaitan inserting those two sentences and interfering in wahi, he says, yes, when you look at them individually, they have weak chains, they have weak isnads. But when you put all of these chains together, when you gather all of these weak reports, it gives you confidence that it, it's likely true because of the sheer quantity of these narrations. Now, what he believes and the way that he understands these narrations, he says that, yes, shaitan inserted the false verses with his own voice. And it was heard by the mushrikeen, those who have corrupt hearts, but not the mu'mineen. And he argues that the Prophet was unaware of this interference. He was unaware of... So there are other narrations that he's basing this off. If you look at the narration in the Tabari, it's, it seems that uh, the Prophet was, uh, was aware, but... In any case, his understanding is that those verses were recited by shaitan and it was heard by mushrikeen, but it was not heard by the believers and the Prophet was unaware of it. So, the Qur'an revelation was not corrupted, but rather shaitan interjected and the mushrikeen, those who have spiritual diseases, they were the ones who heard the voice of shaitan. Now this is, whether this is convincing or not, I leave that up to the listener. But this is how Ibn Hajar tries to make sense of this narration. Now we come to Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah not only argues that this is possible, but he says that it, for sure this to ha this, there is no doubt that this took place. In fact, he uses, and this, this, this is what we argue, brothers and sisters, that when someone takes their, when someone takes their Islam from other than Ahlul Bayt, the mutashabih verses, the ambiguous verses of the Quran, end up leading you astray. Ibn Taymiyyah argues that this story of the, the incident of the satanic verses, not only is it possible, but it happened with certainty. And he bases this off of the Qur'an itself. He says, when you look at verse number 52 of Surah Al-Hajj, he says, the, the insertion of the satanic verses was a test for the people. Now, he also cites Quranic verses that at first glance seem to suggest that the Prophet was inclined to say something that would appease the mushrikeen. So for example, in Surah Al-Isra, and, and these are verses that can very easily be misunderstood if we look at them in isolation of the muhkam verses, the decisive verses. So, Surah Al-Isra, verses 73 to 75. And indeed, they were about to tempt you, meaning you, O Muhammad, Indeed, they were about to tempt you away from that which we revealed to you in order to make you invent about us something else. 
وَإِذًا لَتَّخَذُوكَ خَلِيلًا And then, you would have ta- then they would have taken you as a friend. That Allah is saying to the Prophet that, that you, would, you would have been tempted to... That they were about to tempt you. They were putting so much pressure on you to say something that was not revealed to you. And if you did that, they would consider you a very close friend. وَلَوْلَا أَن ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِدْتَ تَرْكَنُ إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا And if we had not strengthened you, you would have almost inclined to them a little. And then the ayah ends with, إِذَا لَأَذَقْنَاكَ ضِعْفَ الْحَيَاةِ وَضِعْفَ الْمَمَاتِ ثُمَّ لَا تَجِدُ لَكَ عَلَيْنَا نَصِيرًا and if you did that, if you did incline to them, we would, have made, we would have made you taste double punishment in life and double after death. Then you would not find for yourself against us a helper. So Ibn Taymiyyah and his likes, they say, look at this verse. This verse is a clear indication that there was something in the heart of the Prophet that was pushing him to say things that would appease them. And this is why he was vulnerable to the influence of shaitan. Now, the way that we understand this verse is, Allah says, and indeed, they were about to tempt you. No one is denying that the mushrikeen were putting great pressure on the Prophet to compromise. And the mushrikeen wanted the Prophet to invent something, to say something in praise of the idols. And if he did so, they would have taken him as a friend. But what does Allah say? And if we had not strengthened you, and if we had not strengthened you, but Allah did strengthen him, Allah Allah gave him that usma, you would have almost inclined to them a little. Meaning, if it were not for your infallibility, anyone else in your position, Ya Rasulullah, would have given, given to the pressure. It's just like with the story of Yusuf and Zulaikha. Yusuf would have succumbed to his desires if he did not see the proof of his Lord. But since he saw the proof of his Lord, he did not, he did not, uh, he was not tempted. Now, the verse that Ibn Taymiyyah mentions. as one of his strongest evidences is Surah Al-Hajj, verses 52 and 53. So Ibn Taymiyyah says, this verse is evidence that shaitan tampered with the recitation of the Qur'an. And it supports the incident of the satanic verses. What is the, what is the verse? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ إِلَّا إِذَا تَمَنَّا أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَّتِهِ And we did not send before you, O Muhammad, any messenger or prophet except that when he spoke or recited, and really the... It's this verse, understanding this verse boils down to understanding what is the meaning of tamanna or umniya, because it, it has two meanings. It can mean the hope, the desire, or it can mean the recital. So Ibn Taymiyyah understands tamanna or umniya to mean the recital. So his understanding is, the Qur'an says, and we did not send before you any messenger or prophet, except that when he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding. But Allah abolishes that which Satan casts or throws, then Allah makes precise his verses, and Allah is knowing and wise. Now, our understanding is that number one, the dominant view among Shi'i Mufassirin is that the word tamanna means the desire. 
Allah is saying, and we did not send before you any prophet, any messenger or prophet, except that when he desired something, shaitan threw into it, tried to, dis tried to disrupt the desire of the prophets. Now question, what is the hope? What is the desire of the prophets? For their people to be guided. And shaitan wants to corrupt and disrupt this hope. So he misguides people. That's what the ayah is saying. Even if we understand and we interpret, if we construe the word tamanna or umniya to mean recital, it still makes sense. Because it, the, the, the verse can easily mean, and we did not send before you any messenger or prophet except that when he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it some mis misunderstanding. Yes, we can argue that revelation is intact, but when the prophet recites Quran, shaitan creates confusion in the minds and in the hearts of people. He tries to make their hearts arrogant and rebellious. So this verse cannot be used as evidence that shaitan can actually corrupt and alter Quranic verses. And the reason why we say that is because when we go to the decisive verses of the Quran, we see, for example, Allah saying in Surah 15, Surah Al-Hijr, verse 52, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا مَنْ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ Indeed, my servants, no authority will you have over them except those who follow you of the deviators. Now, if shaitan is inserting verses and he's tricking the prophet, this means that shaitan has authority over the prophet. Is there any greater authority over the prophet than to corrupt revelation? Than to present yourself in a way where the prophet cannot distinguish whether you are Jibra'il or Satan? So Allah says, my serv shaitan doesn't have any authority over my servants. So how can he have this type of authority and influence over the Prophet ﷺ? How can he corrupt revelation? And if it's possible for Iblis to insert verses of the Qur'an, how do we know that the rest of Surah Al-Najm is not also satanic ins insertions? So it, it, it casts doubt on the integrity of revelation itself. And what's amazing is that in the same surah, in Surah Al-Najm, which according to these fictitious stories, the, the Iblis inserted those fake verses. In the same surah, Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ that the Prophet doesn't speak of his own accord. What he speaks is inspired revelation. And then you want us to believe at the end of, in the middle of the same surah, the Prophet speaks something that is from Iblis. This contradicts the decisive verses of the Quran. Now, there is a narration mentioned in Bukhari under the section of the merits of the Sahaba. So Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they argue that shaitan tricked the Prophet. He had the audacity to challenge the Prophet, to trick him, to deceive him. Ibn Taymiyyah argues this, that Satan tricked the Prophet. And then Allah, of course, he made the correction later on. This is according to their view. What's amazing and what's unfortunate is that many Muslims today will elevate certain companions over the Prophet himself. So we saw narrations where shaitan deceives the Prophet. He reveals something to the Prophet that is not part of the Qur'an, but the Prophet thinks it's Qur'an and he recites it to the people. Now here is a narration in Bukhari about Umar ibn al-Khattab and the narration says 
استأذن عمر بن الخطاب على رسول الله. عمر بن الخطاب asked permission of the Prophet to enter his home. وعنده نسوة من قريش يكلمنه ويستكثرن عالية أصواتهن على صوته. The narration says that the Prophet was sitting with some women of Quraysh and they were sitting with the Prophet and they were raising their voices meaning that they were very informal with the Prophet. Umar ibn al-Khattab comes to the Prophet's home or wherever the Prophet is and he seeks permission to enter. When Umar was granted permission, when he was given permission to enter, فَلَمَّا اسْتَأْذَنَا عُمَرُ بْنُ الْخَطَّابِ قُمْنَ فَبَادَرْنَا الْحِجَابِ When Umar asked for permission to enter, the women quickly put on their veils, their hijab. Now, were they not wearing hijab in front of the Prophet? You have to see what they say. But let's assume that they were wearing hijab, but they wanted to be even more modest. Imagine. As if, so they want to be more modest with Umar, but they're comfortable being less modest with the Prophet. In any case, this is not the, the most problematic part of the narration. The narration says, فَأَذِنَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So the Prophet gives him permission, he enters, and the Prophet is smiling. And Umar says to the Prophet, فَقَالَ عُمَرْ أَضْحَكَ اللَّهُ سِنَّكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ May Allah always make you happy and smile. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ عَجِبْتُ مِنْ هَؤُلَاءِ اللَّاتِ كُنَّ عِنْدِي اِبْتَدَرْنَ الْحِجَابِ فَلَمَّا سَمِعْنَ صَوْتَكِ اِبْتَدَرْنَ الْحِجَابِ The Prophet says, these women who have been here, they have roused my wonder. For as soon as they heard your voice, they quickly put on their veils. The Prophet says, this was so ajeeb for me, that as soon as they heard your voice, they jumped and they covered up. فَقَالَ عُمَرْ فَأَنْتَ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يَهَبْنَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Umar says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, you have more right to be feared by them than me, meaning that they should have more reverence for you than me. ثُمَّ قَالَ عُمَرْ Umar then turned to these women and he said to them, يَا عَدُوَّاتِ أَنفُسِهِنْ O enemies of yourselves, أَتَهَبْنَنِي وَلَا تَهَبْنَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله Do you fear me? Do you have more reverence for me than Rasulullah? They say to Umar, Yes, فَقُلْنَا نَعَمْ أَنْتَ أَفَضُّ وَأَغْلَظُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Yes, we fear you because you are more harsh and stern than the Messenger of God. And then the Prophet says, allegedly, he says, إِيهَنْ يَبْنَ الْخَطَّابِ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ مَا لَقِيَكَ الشَّيْطَانُ سَالِكًا فَجًّا قَطُّ إِلَّا سَلَكَ فَجًّا غَيْرَ فَجِّكَ The Prophet says, O oh, son of Khattab, by him in whose hand my life is, the Prophet makes a qasam, never does Satan find you going one way, but he takes another way other than yours. Meaning, Shaytan is so afraid of you, O Umar, that when he sees you from a distance, shaitan takes a detour because he doesn't want to even come near you. Because shaitan is afraid of you. He runs away from you. Ajeeb. Isn't this a tragedy, brothers and sisters? Shaitan doesn't fear Rasulullah. He deceives the Prophet. He inserts verses. He is so bold to deceive Rasulullah, but Umar ibn al-Khattab, no. We have to take a detour. This is an example of how Muslims today, 
they are willing, and many of them are innocent, they are victims of propaganda, they are willing to denigrate the Prophet in order to uplift certain individuals. So, the point is, brothers and sisters, going back to our original point, the reason why, our understanding is that the reason why those first emigrants returned to Mecca from Abyssinia is because is not because of these fictitious stories. And perhaps these stories were invented. It's possible that they were invented later about the satanic verses. They were invented because perhaps the pagans needed to make something up to explain why they prostrated when the Prophet recited Surah An-Najm. So this is one theory that the reason why this story even emerged is because the Mushrikeen, they were embarrassed. They needed an explanation as to why they became so enchanted by the Qur'an. So they made up the story that Muhammad praised our idols and uh, this is why they prostrated. But it seems that what is most likely is that the Mushrikeen did prostrate because of the beauty of Surat Al-Najm and a rumor spread that the leaders of the pagans had converted to Islam and the rumors reached Abyssinia and perhaps this is the reason why the first wave of emigrants returned to Mecca and of course after a short while the Prophet sent uh, a second wave of emigrants led by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And inshallah, in our uh, next episode, we'll speak about a correspondence between uh, Najashi and the Prophet. And inshallah, in the coming episodes, we'll speak about the conversion of Hamza and the story about the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Uh, I look forward to having you join me on more episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Any questions or comments? In, in this story, could you explain a little bit about why the... Kind of what, what the mindset is of pagans where they feel so compelled to prostrate from the verses. Because it just, it feels a little bit alien uh, of a concept. Yeah, <clears throat> very good question. As I mentioned, the mushrikeen, they, they believe in God. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a foreign concept to them. Allah in many verses, He says to the Prophet, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask these mushrikeen, who created the heavens and the earth? لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ They will undoubtedly, surely say that it is Allah. So combining this, the fact that they believed that Allah is the ultimate deity, that He is the creator God, and you combine that with the mesmerizing eloquence of the Qur'an. You know, the way that we hear the Qur'an is not the same way that they heard it, brothers and sisters. The Qur'an was mesmerizing to them. You know, because we are not well-versed in ancient Arabic, we don't appreciate the nuances of the verse. The likes of Abu Jahal, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, they were experts in Arabic. They, they appreciated those nuances. So, it would even though they rejected faith, the verses would still strike them in a way that they probably don't even strike you and I. Because we are so far removed from that era of appreciating the richness of the language. So, I think that they were just so emotionally overwhelmed and the, the rhythm and the beauty that it was almost involuntary on their part. You know, sometimes when you see something that is, you know, so overwhelming, your eyes tear up involuntarily. 
It's just a natural reaction to something that is so stunningly beautiful. So this is perhaps the reason why. Uh, so it's not that they they made a niya to prostrate. It was just a spontaneous reaction to the, the, the literary beauty and the power of the Qur'an. And, and also the fact that they believe in Allah. But uh, because that prostration could be interpreted as surrender on their part, it's, it's very plausible that the story of the satanic verses was probably invented uh, by the pagans or by others to, to justify that prostration. And Allah knows best. We don't, we don't know exactly where this, the incident of the satanic verses originated, but when you look at the story from all of its angles and you take into consideration you know, human psychology, uh, this seems to be a, a very plausible uh, ver- interpretation of the story. What are some uh, lessons that we might be able to apply to our lives uh, from this story? From the the story of the of the satanic verses. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if there's anything. I mean, it, I think what if if it teaches us anything is that you know how how quickly rumors can spread. You know, sometimes. You know, today, obviously, we we understand and we see how quickly false information can circulate. And, you know, we're 1,400 years later, and this fabrication exists today, and it impacts the theological understanding of Muslims. So I think that if it teaches us anything, it needs to teach us the importance of verifying information you know not just so you know one of the reasons why muslims came the muslims perhaps returned from abyssinia early and then they ended up suffering is because they didn't verify the information and the information was what that the pagans have embraced islam so i think that we should not believe everything that we hear I think this is a very important takeaway, a very practical lesson that we learn from this incident. That, you know, sometimes information may reach us from reliable people, but sometimes reliable people are just passing on information that they heard from others. So, you know, when we studied uh, Surah Al Hujurat, we mentioned, you know, ya, ya amanu, in ja'akum in that whenever we receive information, we have to verify it. Because if we pass on information without verifying it, we can cause a lot of harm. And unfortunately today, you know, this these stories are spread. And today, m- many Muslims believe in the veracity of these reports and you see that it even you know they believe in things that denigrate the lofty status of the prophet and it go, all goes back to people absorbing and believing things without reflecting without authenticating without verifying that information And in the verses, uh, Surah 17, verses 73 to 75, when the Quran was talking about, if you hadn't spent the you, you would have been inclined to them. Uh, the ending part of it almost sounds like a, like a threat. So if this isn't really a warning against the Prophet, because he was already strengthened, then how are we supposed to interpret the second half of it? Half of this? So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighting a theoretical punishment does not mean that this is something that that could happen. What Allah is trying to highlight it is that hypothetically, if the Prophet 
were to give in and compromise, he would receive double the punishment. Why? Because he would be destroying his own soul and he would be leading people astray. So you would be causing self-harm and harm to others. So this, this verse is based, and, and there are other verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, says to the Prophet, you know, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ if the prophet, if the, if the prophet fabricates and he makes up uh, verses, we would seize him and we would sever his his jugular vein. The point of these verses is to highlight that there is no compromise when it comes to revelation. That the prophet doesn't have any control over what verses are revealed or what verses are not revealed. This is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the, this verse is essentially highlighting, number one, the infallibility of the Prophet. Because Allah says, and if we had not strengthened you, which implies that he has been strengthened by the Prophet. And the dire consequences, if the Prophet were to give in, hypothetically, if the Prophet were to succumb to those pressures, he would face uh, unimaginable punishment because of what is at stake. And because what is at stake is so great, Allah reinforces and protects and He guards uh, His Messenger and the Message. Well, asked, um, the book that Salman Rushdie wrote, uh, is this related? Is it related to this incident at all? Yeah, so it, it's uh, I haven't read the book, but from what I've understood, it's it's uh, it's predicated on this uh, this uh, this fictitious story. But I haven't read it, I haven't read it myself. So if anyone has, maybe they can share. But uh, but it seems to be related or predicated on this uh, on this fabrication. Well, thank you very much, Shaykh. Ahsantum, Jazakumullah. Thank you so much, and. Uh, I look forward uh, to being with you guys next week, bi'idhnillah.